Pop Battles. This is a line of games, so word games that I just discovered. Uh, the first one that I played is Brandywine, so we're in the Revolutionary War. Two players, but the game can also be played solitaire by a single player controlling both sides at the best of their possibilities, and this is precisely how I played it. So Pop Battles is the name of this line of games, so this family of games. Um, I assume that because they are meant to be played in pubs, which works from the tr from the point of view of complexity of setup, which is not to elaborate, and, and you can play the game in another two hours. So I guess you're there drinking and happy. I'm not sure that I would ever want to play that in a pub because the beautiful map that the game comes with is made of paper and doesn't look like it's laminated or anything, so I'd be too concerned uh, spillages. Also, as you may have noticed, instead of a box, it comes in a plastic tube, which is just a little more annoying to store when you have a collection of war games. You can't really stack it like you would do with regular uh, boxes. For the components, the map, although it's rolled into that tube, it still lays down flat on the table. You don't need any um, piece of plexiglass on it or anything like that, so that's great. The other thing that's a little bit weird is that uh, um, the rule book and uh, then the scenario book, the specific, the rule book with the core rules of the system and the book with the rules for this specific game, they will always look a little bit like this. And reading a rule book like this is just a little more annoying, I believe. So I don't know, I think I would have been happy with a map folded in four and that comes in a in a box. You had these screens here, you had to cut them, they come in a single sheet and then you fold them and basically they will allow you to hide forces so I can have a counter representing Cornwallis on the on the board but not the forces controlled by Cornwallis himself, I can hide them here with this side facing the opponent, this side facing me, reminding me of who is controlling those forces. This is a nice touch. You have a ruler made of paper with the maximum distances for mounted and foot because this is the play area. So as you can imagine, it is a miniature game in the sense that you uh, check distances on the on the actual map and not counting spaces. And then we have these two bags that represent that contain the playing pieces and so this is really nice like we have seen probably in some other war games so the playing pieces are um, represented by wooden blocks low wooden blocks that when they are on the board they look like the lines that you have in military maps usually each side has three six-sided dice and so uh, at the beginning of the game, I'm going to set up kind of randomly to give you a sense of what it will look like. The players will set up their forces, dividing in commands. We have uh, we have guns, we have regular troops, uh, we have militia, we have uh, elite troops uh, that have a shiny sticker, and so I really uh, like this. Yeah, elite. And so you're simply going to place them there, again, following the rules and instructions. But to give you again a sense of what it may look like. We have baggage train, very important. And we have detachments that don't have a sticker. They don't do much other than delaying the opponent and taking, and taking some hits. And then we have our commanders, hooray! The commanders. Uh, have a rating there indicated by the number of squares. I believe I'm not sure that the rules really explain what that is for, but that's how I play the game. And so uh, it will look, it may look a little bit like this, but not exactly. <laughs> meaning, meaning, meaning. Uh, in this scenario, first uh, we're brandy wine, so we're gonna have the the revolutionary forces set up here, and their job is to try to stop the advance of the of the of the English forces. Then we're gonna have uh, the English forces split into two main groups. A group sets up on the map first, so based on that then the uh, revolutionary forces set up on this other side of Brandywine Creek. And then the second 
English force sets up and this is when it gets pretty interesting and cool because they can choose to set it up coming from this edge coming here from the center or coming from the right. Uh, I played the game Solitaire. They recommend if you play against a human opponent that you write down the orders so that you commit to those maneuvers. It works very well Solitaire because you set up the first uh, English force, then the revolutionary forces, and then you roll a die. One, two, three, four, five, six, and that decides where the secondary uh, where the secondary English force comes from, and that's uh, and that's pretty neat. That's really cool. Couple of other things: if you play against a human opponent, the rules make a big, 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 big deal about secrecy, about the fact that you can place the blocks that way. So uh, hiding which unit is which, hiding the quality. And then when a unit is spent, very important concept, then you flip it this way, to it this way it becomes visible, and also it will be uh, in more dangerous as you will see. Uh, I played the game Solitaire, so the way that I did it, I lost that element of secrecy, all stickers were facing up, as you see now, and when a unit became spent, then I would put it on the side, still facing me, and that's important because I wanna know the difference between a unit that is spent with the sticker not on top and a unit that doesn't have any sticker like a detachment. So you make that little adjustment there if you're playing the game solitaire you will know what uh, what the what is what what is what. Now this is a chit pull game and you know that I like the kind of game you're gonna have these chits that indicate different commands you place them in a pet container and then they're drawn suppose that we had drawn the one representing Corvallis then the forces on the Corvallis control can go or do they because uh, commanders that are not spent yet can try to uh, to jump, that is to jump ahead and to activate even though they, uh, their counter has not been drawn yet. Or you can also try to delay, say Cornwallis doesn't want to go now. So if you decide to do so, you roll a die, if you roll equal to or lower than the rating of the commander, you're successful. And so you're able to delay, if that's what you were trying to do. Or to jump ahead. If say Cornwallis came out but Washington wanted to activate, you roll the die for Washington equal to lower than the ratings, then Washington goes. So you can try to manipulate that. Either way, whether the attempt is successful or not, then you count the commander as spent, you flip it that way with the flag up. All it means is simply cannot, the commander will still activate as normal but cannot try to alter the random sequence of activation again. So that's pretty cool. So that way, between the uh, chit pull and possibly die roll, so we're gonna determine who activates next, who activates now. The forces that activate can, uh, can move, and there are a couple of interesting things here. They can move up to uh, their mounted or foot movement, as indicated here. The terrain that they're in, as you can see, the terrain is just marked like on a regular map. It's it, the terrain that they count as being in is the one where the majority of the block is now. So although, for example, these grenadiers are like touching there, they don't count as being in the creek. These units here, uh, they would say they're mainly in wood, so they would count as woods. This artillery here, uh, it's mainly not in the woods, and I would say so it doesn't count as being in the wood. So as you move, if you enter terrain that gives you a penalty such as the wood, you lose a third of your regular movement, be that foot or mounted. If you move in, again, terrain that say gives you cover or affects movement that way. You can move twice as fast if you're on the road and you're moving as a column, but that also gives you penalties in combat, so pretty dangerous. As for turning around, each turn you get a free change of facing, no cost uh, applied. Then again, you can move and then you can change facing again, but that time when you do so, it costs you one third again of your movement, be that mounted or 
foot. You can move within, uh, within basically, basically you can move close to an enemy only if you have a commander in rage, in rage, in range, and in rage also, that allows you to get in contact. You can just stand there close to the opponent without making contact because that doesn't make any sense. So you go there. When you move to attack and a commander lets you do so, then you make contact. One or two units can make contact, so to speak, meaning one unit can make contact with an opponent and can have a unit right behind and that counts as supporting. Combat will still be only between the two units that are touching, but if this unit is destroyed, eliminated or forced to retreat, then the unit that was supporting can choose to retreat also or can choose to uh, continue the fight. So that's what we got there. Uh, because maneuvering happens, you may also be able to boop to uh, attack an opponent from their flank and that of course is very good. So that's the kind of the general idea about moving. Uh, moving is very simple therefore, but also because of the situations, the position of the units, a, a million different cases will emerge. Again, because of the map doesn't have clearly separated areas. And as you will see, I'll say in the conclusions, this is a game that really lends itself to either side to play because you have no reason to take sides. You just adjudicate things as they make sense. Or again, having a referee or two players that again, they care about the general flow of the action a lot more than exploiting that movement and that maneuver and that little piece of terrain, etc, etc, etc. So if you don't obsess about things too much, movement is fun, uh, realistic and makes sense. Then it's time to fight. When you fight, the general idea is, and it's better if I show you the player aid here, to resolve combat. The stepping combats are that each round of combat the lead piece for the defender and that for the attacker that are in contact will fire and hits are applied simultaneously. Then the defender decides if they want to retreat, the attacker decides if they want to retreat, and then you repeat until there is no contact anymore because one or both sides retreated or one or both sides have been completely eliminated, which may happen. That's the general flow. When you are rolling dice for the, for the pieces in contact, Simply roll a number of dice based on the kind of unit that that is. Four, five, or sixes are always hits, so that's pretty good. With some modifiers, and that's the interesting thing. Some terrains will give you penalties, say firing against a unit in cover. Uh, the defender, will, the attacker firing against a defender in cover has a minus one, and that can be pretty heavy penalty. If you're firing into the flank of a unit, you have a plus one and the unit firing from a flank is a minus one. So we determine the number of hits. The number of hits will have different effects based on whether the unit is fresh or spent. Again, it depends on you know, how you, which side is up, uh, how you're gonna play. Because a spent unit must retreat and is eliminated, a fresh unit will become spent and then possibly retreat or simply be immediately eliminated. The quality of the unit, indicated by the type and color of the sticker, does not affect how you fire but affect, uh, affects how you take hits. For example, elite troops, those with the shiny stickers, will be able to ignore the first hit in combat but green and militia troop will take the first hitting combat as two. So they will never just become spent, even in the best case scenario, they will always become spent and retreat at least. And a couple of other general situations will emerge. To win, you score points by eliminating enemy units, but ultimately the points that you score are just to give you a general sense of how well you're doing. It's to win, you need to meet other kinds of conditions, so it's entirely possible to win when you don't have the maximum number of score of, of, of victory points. That's unusual. Victory is based on routing the opponent that is inflicting 50% infantry losses on the enemy, or destroying their baggage train, or forcing them to unpack. Basically, when your units are spent, to unspend them, they need to be within 
uh, range of a baggage train that has been unpacked. And again, the way I unpack it is it's, it's, it's packed when the sticker is up it's unpacked when the sticker is on the side facing me. Then a unit that is spent and is within range of an unpacked baggage, instead of moving when it is activated, it can go from spent to fresh. But if you're forced to repackage your baggage train, that also loses you the game. So those are the three things that you need to, um, well, the three things that if a player achieves one of them, the player well, loses or wins. If you force the opponent to pack as their baggage or you destroy their baggage or you destroy half of their infantry, then you win the game. And that seems to be the standard way in which you win games in the pub battle system. I'm glad that I discovered the pub battle system because I definitely enjoyed this game. I definitely enjoyed Brandywine. Uh, it was a good battle that I played by myself, controlling both sides to the best of your possi uh, of my possibilities. And you should play the game. If you play the game the way, then you'll do it at the best of your possibilities. It is definitely a solitaire friendly game, although reading the rule book, it's very different from how the design originally conceived it because there was a lot of attention that was paid to, to um, Fog of War uh, to the point they even recommend when you select, uh, when you draw an activation chip, you cover most of it with your thumb so you just pick up the color so you know who activates activates next but you don't know who that is in case you didn't draw it you give them to the opponent um, or like I do you just play with all the pieces visible and just because of the random chat activation you're still gonna have a lot of surprises uh, even including the attempted the different attempts uh, from the commanders of altering the order of the activations that may or not, may not happen. Wallace is there and wants to push and destroy the and destroy the revolutionaries before they get a chance of moving back and maybe re regroup around the baggage train. And he wants to do that, and that's not going to happen. Or uh, or Washington is able to activate out of turn and and turn around the flank and inflict uh, inflict a considerable uh, loss uh, to the opponent, which otherwise would be something very hard to do if you're just there frontally. So it's really nice to see all of these surprising moments that emerge from the from the chip pull system, which is a system that I like very much. And again, you're still going to have plenty of uncertainty between the activations and the die rolls. Plenty of uncertainty, even if you control all forces in play. Plus, again, the, the, the variable setup here lends itself very well to that random, uh, unpredictable element that you don't know where the other uh, English force is going to come in. So, fun, fun, fun stuff. Uh, fun because also the fact that I played by myself uh, meant that I didn't really care about optimizing, maximizing this or that. And again, this is really a game that lends itself to a lot of ambiguities and uncertainties. Because of the map, primarily, is that this step is really mainly on forest? Is that really like 50%? If you wanted to play in a tournament and really be uh, really be accurate and precise, this game can turn into an exercise of just being super annoying and, and it would totally suck the joy out of the experience. You gotta play by yourself where you really don't care other than the, the action makes sense. Always somebody with that same philosophy. Yeah, maybe you're right, maybe I'm wrong. Let's roll a die to determine whether the cover applies here or not. Um, or, or, or if you have a judge, if there is a referee also. That. So, like many, many war games, really, uh, not all, but many war games that have to do with the miniature element of this kind, where there are ambiguities that will emerge from the terrain, you gotta be with the right partner and or in the right spirit or just by yourself. On top of this, the rulebook also is very short, which seems, hey, you're right, but time, but experience has shown me that sometimes the short rulebook means that you're gonna spend more time later looking for errata, looking for FAQs, or, if I'm playing by myself, figuring it out, adjudicating things as best they make sense, or again, if you have a third party that is gonna act as a referee, that also. So, uh, it's a game that, with four or five pages of rules, and, and everything is very intuitive, 
could be a beginner's war game, but I'm not sure that I would recommend it for that. Because you really need to have, I believe, a certain amount of experience under your belt, a certain wargamer knowledge, uh, to be able to really uh, figure out the certain ambiguities and decide here or there. As, as a beginner, usually you want clear rules that you can just follow and then they make sense as they are, and then after you play many war games, oh yeah, this makes sense this way or that way. So although it has, it doesn't have the complexity of an advanced uh, war game, I believe it's a war game that will be mainly or mostly or best enjoyed. Uh, either again, if there is a seasoned war gamer overseeing the thing, or by somebody who is familiar with the conventions of wargaming and then is able to make those decisions, those determinations by themselves. But other than that, if you're in that mood, uh, in that spirit of like, I really want to enjoy the action, then the game is very solid and very fun. It's, it, it feels so fresh and different from so many other games and it really has been distilled down to uh, the main general ideas, really down to move and attack uh, in ways that make sense under the circumstances, use the commanders to, <clears throat> uh, to incentivize movement uh, and attack, but that's almost that. Of course, there is then the element of uh, figuring out where you want to unpack your baggage, that's a really important decision because you cannot undo it without losing the game, and so how to figure out then how to move your troops so where they can move from spent to fresh again, etc, etc, etc. But other than that, it's just moving and attacking and gaining position. So you really are in a situation where the simplicity of the rules really allows you to put all of your attention on the strategic element, on the maneuvering, on the general action, rather than going around the board looking for that one missing point that will allow you to get a 3 to 2 instead of like a less favorable ratio on a combat table. Um, you don't go through a laundry list of possible modifiers and you see if you can get a plus 4 instead of a plus 3. It really is about the big picture. You're really looking at this military map that looks like a military map, looking at those units that look like lines on a military map, and you're really looking at the big picture and and really being invested in the general flow of the battle. And to me that's that's quite remarkable. Again, the price to pay is you gotta adjudicate situations as they make sense uh, because they're not covered by the rules. And if they would, they would make the game, well, they would lose all the advantage of the big picture because then you go back to, but if one corner touches that part and the other part, blah, 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 blah. So, it's a game, I believe, for a specific kind of war gamer, but there's a lot to be liked if you're in the right perspective and you're playing it with, with the right people in case, again, uh, you're playing it with human opponents. One thing to say more about that you should really care about the action more than the result of the victory, the game doesn't feel balanced. I, it, my impression is that the American side is a lot harder to win uh, than the British side. You can be a bit blunt, you can be a little more careless when you send those large columns against those thin American forces. Uh, you can make more mistakes when you're playing as the as Wallis and friends. As the Americans, you really have to, to be careful, to exploit terrain. If you are caught by mistake in open terrain, then, then, then it's done. So you really need to figure out where to place your baggage train, how to best exploit terrain, how to keep a line that will slowly weaken the English, uh, the English forces and then at some point maybe launch a counter-attack. You may just be able to win by being the defender almost every time, uh, which feels historical, but again makes for and gives you the advantage of asymmetrical gameplay, more replay value because by switching sides you feel like you have a different set of priorities and issues and, and dilemmas, but it also means that, at least in my experience, one side will achieve victory uh, less often. Which again is great if you're playing historical war games to learn about history, to enjoy this way of exploring history rather than just to win. So, pub battles 
Brandywine 1777. I would never play this game in a puzzle because it'd be too af in a puzzle in a pub uh, because I'd be too afraid of, of spilling drinks there. But definitely a game that is very refreshing, different from most war games that I played. Very simple, but again, you need to be in a spirit where the historical experience is a lot more important than winning or following the rules, especially because you may end up making up rules or interpreting rules so often that the game really becomes your own personal experience. But again, it requires a certain kind of word gamer and a certain kind of mood, I would say. Within those parameters, there's a game that really is fun to play and it's quite impressive because it feels so unique and so historical and so thematic and yet also so manageable if you're willing to make the decisions, of course.